Folks, we actually have about two minutes before we begin, but I uh, looked on my Facebook page here, and I want to thank Roland Barrow, Roland's a pastor in the Philippines, James Lukina, and Ryan Donwata, all these are Filipino friends, Filipino friends, and uh, they have shared tonight's, uh, tonight's message on their on their timelines so Roland and James and Ryan uh, we see you quite often and uh, I miss uh, being with you uh, as I had in the past but uh, I'm grateful that uh, Sir Darrell is able to be with you uh, and uh, continue to teach uh, as an extension of my ministry in the Philippines at this point in time so God bless all of you and thank you for logging on and or sharing uh, my tonight's message. God bless you guys. We got a good group of people on on Zoom tonight, uh, my wife Janet, Karen Torrance, Angie Black, Kat Kennedy, Kimberly Williams, uh, Leonard, and uh, Linda Benton, Roger Lamuco, and my son Brian, and Carolyn, uh, Carolyn. And Danny Plummer and Richard Anita Clark. God bless all of you for being logged on here tonight. And it is really right down next to time to begin. So let me get everything started here. Recording in progress. I imagine you can hear that when we when it starts like that. Okay, folks, the Word of God is alive and powerful. It's time to start. It's um, the Word of God. Yes, it is. And as it says, it's, it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. I've said this so many times, and I'm wondering, uh, wondering if uh, we really understand all that that means. It, uh, it looks pretty simple. But uh, we have new people to come to us, and I think maybe it would be good if I took some time in the near future and took this, took these phrases and broke them down and explained, for example, what does it mean to divide asunder between the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow? We'll talk about that later. All scripture is God-breathed. Yes, it is. And it's, in, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may mature, Thirdly, furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And every time was as I uh, pause to study the word of God. Yesterday was a was a good day for me as far as studying is concerned. I got up early in the morning, and after I had breakfast, I didn't even take my night clothes off. I got back in bed with my computer. I got out for lunch. Got back in bed. Got up for supper, got back in bed, and I think that we finally, I finally turned this thing off at about midnight. Listen, the Word of God is absolutely imperative. It's important to our life. As a pastor, I deem the Word of God to be the answer for your life and mine. So with that in mind, we're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's Word through the technique of rebound and operation cry. And this is another thing that many do not understand. As a matter of fact, many reject simply because it is I that's teaching it. No big deal. I can handle that. But the truth of the matter is because I'm saying it, not some other pastor out there is saying this. Guess what? They say, no, no, no. That's a deviation from what our mentor taught us. Well, I understand all that too. But the truth of the matter is until we learn how to do and, and uh, live the Christian way of life according to God's protocol plan. Remember, protocol is a rigid, long-established code, prescribing complete deference to superior rank and authority, followed by strict, adher uh, strict adherence to due order precedence, and coupled with a precisely correct procedure. 
That's what the plan of God is. Now, I know that's a lot of words, and many times if you say that, if you hadn't ever heard that before, you'd say, what is this guy talking about? Well, the truth of the matter is, again, I indicated to you, I was going to draw a diagram for you. I've got it started, but I haven't got it finished. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but I'm going to work on it to show you what it means to show the difference between objective thinking objective an objective attitude an objective means of living the christian way of life as opposed to subjective subjectivity what's the difference between the two well listen one is religious and the other is spiritual and until we learn to live the spiritual life all of this is just it's not foolishness but it's worthless to you in your own christian life and the tragedy is, is that one day, and it, is, it will be a tragedy, is that when we appear before the Bema Seat of Christ and God takes all this good that we've done and we see how much of it burns up because it was human good and not divine good, because we're, we were following the prescription of human viewpoint as opposed to divine viewpoint. Listen, this is the angelic conflict. This is not a game we're playing. Salvation is not the end of the road. It's just the beginning of the Christian way of life. And oh my goodness, when we take a look at what's happening to the, uh, to the, to the Jews, the Israelites, Israel as a nation coming out of Egypt and on the way to the promised land, and now they are on the border. All they've got to do is step into the promised land now. Step into Canaan. But wait a minute. We've got all those people who live there that are our enemies. And oh my, look at them. Not only are the grapes big, but boy, that must mean the people in there are, how could a little guy eat something like that? This must, these people must be humongous. So then what happens is we're going to rebel against Moses and Aaron, and we're going to say, huh, we're not going in there. Listen, Israel's, Israel's journey was from Egypt to the promised land. Once they entered into Canaan, they're in a the promised land. Now what they're going to have to do is clear that thing out. And God's going to tell them, kill these people, kill these people, kill these people, do this, do that. Hey, and when you look out and you see, wow, oh my goodness, how in the world can we, how in the world can we handle those people? Look how big they are. See, what happens is there is an analogy here, and that is your, your and my promised land is maximum spiritual maturity, moving and advancing. See, they started out, they started out as slaves to Egypt. To the Pharaoh, we start out as slaves to the old sin nature. And by the time you get to maximum spiritual maturity, you have victory over the old sin nature. You're no longer slaved to the old sin nature. They, were, they would not be slaves to anybody once they entered the promised land. But every time they had adversity, guess what they did? They threw in the towel. They complained. They belly ached. They blame somebody else for what the problem was. No, that's not it. God wants us to have an objective mind, an object, uh, ob objectivity as a way of life so that what we're doing is looking to him and not looking at the problem. Now, if we finish early, I've got, uh, I've got several promises here that I'll read to you to help you to understand that th this is not a game. God wants, it. listen, it's all in. It's not partly in. It's not 50 to 50, 50 my life, 50 God's life. It's not 40, 60. It's not 80, 20. It's 100 to nothing. And that's what happens when we reach maximum spiritual maturity. God wants us focused on Christ. Thinking like he thinks, feeling like he feels, speaking like he speaks, doing like he did. Not looking to the Old Testament for guidelines, but, oh, looking to the Old Testament for illustrations to see how the essence of God deals with mankind in the midst of the angelic conflict. So with that in mind, let's take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's Word. You know what that is. 1 John 1, 9, Romans 6, 6, 6, 11, and 6, 13. You handle that, and we'll pick up our study right where we left off.
Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of studying your word. This is not just a this is not just a Bible study. This is a study about life. We learn from the Bible how to live the Christian way of life. Studying the Bible alone is not enough. We got our heads filled, crammed full of do doctrinal information, the principles, the promises, doctrines, techniques, and turn right around and do like the Israelites did, complain and bellyache about the next adversity that we're facing. Oh my. No, Lord. No, that, that's not what you want. And when we find ourselves not living that way, we sense the pressure in our life and begin to realize this is you when we understand how you handle the Israelites goodness gracious this is no this is no big deal this isn't rocket science understanding how you handled Israel from the from the standpoint of your essence sovereignty eternal life love justice absolute righteousness omnipotence omniscience omnipresence immutability and veracity so when we have a problem and we're not handling it, what we need to do is ask ourselves, what part of God's essence are we not trusting? So, Father, may I be a, may I be a light. May I be a guide. But remember, Father, the pastor-teacher has authority, and that authority must be used to handle the Christian way of life. So with that in mind, Father, we turn ourselves over to you and ask you tonight through your spirit, to guide us into deeper truth into how to live the Christian way of life. The one thing we know is this. Don't complain. Don't argue. Don't marabah. Don't this. This is what Christianity is. So I'm asking you, Father, to teach us again tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Sir Darrell is just about on his way to the Philippines uh, he's going to, uh, when they leave Denver in a few days, they're going to be, when he gets to Denver, they'll be there for a few days. Then they're going to move, uh, advance over to Hawaii to attend a funeral of a very precious friend of Nita, uh, Nita Anderson. And once they have um, uh, been to that funeral, they're going to get the flight to Guam. And I'll tell you what we can do. We can be praying for a flight out of Guam. Of course, they're flying uh, space available. And um, uh, we need to pray that uh, God will provide seats on the plane to get into Manila. Then they catch another flight from Manila down to Davao City. And, of course, they want to get there before the, before the camp, uh, the, uh, the Timothy camp that's uh, been organized for young people for several years now. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and turn to our... Uh, turn to our uh, uh, passage of scripture, one more thing. Mark your calendar, April 9th, for American Pie Pizza. Okay, I'm going to share um, a new page. And that will be our, our notes. And let's review just briefly as we get started. We're talking about the 14 times when Israel complained on their journey from Egypt to to the promised land. Now remember tonight, they are on the, on the border of entering into the promised land. And what we're going to see is why they didn't want to go in. But let's take a look at what we've actually seen so far. We've actually seen nine of these complaints. And what happened is that first of all, they complained to Moses about talking to Pharaoh. We saw that they complained and told Moses to leave us alone. Don't bug us anymore. Thirdly, the Israelites complained about being hungry. I didn't have enough food. And then they complained about bitter water. Oh, we want some water, but oh, it's so bitter, Moses. Then the people complained about no water. Bitter water, no, no water. Under the Red Sea, it was too much water. Then they complained about Moses being absent, oh, well, he went up on the mountain. When is he coming? I guess he's never coming back. Aaron, please, melt down the gold and give us a golden calf. We need something to worship. Well, he did that. Then the mixed multitude, that was some Gentiles and among the Jews, all those people began to complain again about their food. Then Miriam, the sister of Moses, and Aaron, the brother of Moses, complained about Moses' leadership. 
Now we see, in point number nine, the ninth time, the people complained about giants in the land. Oh my goodness, the giants. Well, just, just hang on, folks. When you take a look at all that's going on today, you listen to the news today, oh my. Giant, China seems to be the giant. No, it's Russia. No, it's Iran. No, it's North, North, uh, North Korea. No, no, see, we got all these giants in the land. And oh my, we can't do anything about this, can we, Lord? So I guess what we need to do is get back into Egypt, get back to where we came from, See, Numbers 14.1, then, is, uh, is dealing with this idea of giants in the land. We actually started that last Sunday. Now, we're picking up sort of like in the middle of that study of the people complaining about the giants in the land. And we'll give you a little background here again, then. But in four, Numbers 14, verse 1, it says, then all, then all of the congregation, what did they do? What did the congregation do? All of the congregation raised their voices and cried out. That means they were screaming and yelling and crying. And it says, and the people wept that night. What are they weeping about? You see, the tribes of Israel were confronted with two reports. Moses has them stop on the border of crossing over into in the, to Canaan, which will be going to be the, the part of the promised land. It's just the, the first part of the promised land. And, Mo, and God tells uh, other people, Cain to Moses, and said, hey, we, we, we wanted to go in there and spy out the land. Moses said, okay, just a second, let me see about this. God told Moses, send them in. Send 12 spies. One spy from each of the 12 tribes. So Joshua and Caleb were two of those spies, and the 10 went in and spent 40 days there. Then they came back carrying grapes and pom pomegranates, and they had these poles, poles between a pole between two guys, and they've got these giant grapes and pomegranates on that pole to come back to show the people and Moses what the land is really like. So when they when Moses asked, "Okay, how about a report? What's going on here?" Caleb and Joshua are the two good guys. They've got positive volition. They're trusting God in all the circumstances of life. They've seen all the miracles. They've seen the supernatural events. They came out of Egypt, seeing all that that went on in Egypt. So Joshua and Caleb gave a positive report, a good report. And 10 of the spies, that's the remaining 10. So Joshua and Caleb did a good job, giving a good report, an honest report, straightforward and the ten, ten spies gave a bad report. And guess what? The people, the multitude of people, didn't believe Joshua and Caleb. What they did is they believed the ten spies and their bad report. And guess what they did? They wept all that night. Just sat around and cried. We can't do that. Well, let's take a look here. Let's begin by considering these four things. In light of this fact that they, they hear two reports and the people buy the bad report. So you've got two strong guys and ten weak guys. And obviously, the multitude of people, the Israelites, the, the sons of God here, these people are also weak because they were not willing to believe uh, Joshua and Caleb. They were not willing to believe God and all the promises and all the supernatural things that they, they, they'd seen and heard. And this is a good illustration to, to you and me. So when we look at the giant of, of uh, North, uh, North Korea, when we look at the giant of China, when we look at the giant of Russia, when we look at the giant of Iran, look at the giant of somebody else out here. I say, oh no, we, we, we're, we're lost. We're, we're done. We're done. Oh, I wish we'd, I wish we could just go back a few years where we didn't have this kind of stuff. No, this is human history. This is the way, this is the way it goes. This is God's plan in the midst of the angelic conflict, looking to people like you and me to handle life, to give evidence of the, of the sufficiency of God's grace, his provision. So that when you see the lower creature, namely you, namely me, no, namely human beings, doing what God would, would want, 
doing what God designed. This means that the, the, the higher creature, the stronger creature, namely Satan, could have done but didn't, and God is vindicated justified in sending Satan and all fallen angels and every unbeliever to the lake of fire. And you and I, because of our failures, if there are any, we lose our reward at the Bema seat. See, this isn't a game. I know you know that. But this is why I, I want to make sure you understand what it means to have a... a an objective mental attitude. Now I'll give you, a, I'll give you a hint as to where we're going. Believers who have an objective mental attitude look at the solution, not the problem. So you have a problem, I have a problem, we have a problem. Some people look at the problem and never get over it. And they do exactly like the Jews. Oh my goodness, look how bad this is. Oh, I guess we're all, we're done in. No, we'll, never, we'll never make it out of here. Oh my Let's please send us back to where, where we used to be. It was so good back there. No, they, cr they cried for 400 years to get out of there. See, these are people that complain, complain, complain. That's not what God wants. So let's begin by looking at four things. You and I, we as born-again Christians, we often expect God to make everything easy. Now, that may not be you. But I can tell you for a fact that I'm speaking to the majority of Christians today. It's because they don't understand. And I see here now that I've got an internet connection that's unstable. I don't know how that's affecting you out there. But I just got this message came up across the street that my internet is unstable. Father, listen, we need this message. I'm going to ask right now that you show us and with your power, your, your glory, make this message available to everyone that's logged on. In Christ's name, amen. We often expect God to make everything easy. Oh yes, boy, now that I'm saved, I guess everything is going to be just fine. And then people can't understand why they have these problems, why they face adversity, why they do this, why they do what, whatever's going on in their life. And these are things that people don't want. They don't like it. They, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm a born-again Christian. I thought everything was supposed to be easy. See, we often expect God to make everything easy. And one of the reasons why that happens is because pastors are not teaching what the Christian way of life is all about. They don't teach about, uh, about human history. They don't, make, um, they don't make history and the truths about history going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. They don't make this clear to people. So somehow or another, I don't know why this thing is we need to do, why we need to get saved, but I'd be being told, you know, you need to get saved. So, okay, I'll trust Jesus. And you supposedly trust him and then can't figure out why everything isn't easy in your life. So we often expect God to make everything easy. And today, that's why most Christians dislike adversity. They dislike adversity. And the truth of the matter is, and I was talking to one of our friends that uh, is online with us nearly every time we're, we're online, and, and this, this person was asking a question about why God sent a demon, a, a demon to, um, to, to stir King Saul up. Why? And wait a minute. King Saul was a believer. Why did God send a demon to get after him, to mix him up? What was going on there? Well, you see, what happens when you take a look at life and you see all the, every adversity, and not necessary, this isn't something you cause for yourself, but what you're looking up and you see all these things that are causing pressure in your life, say, wait a minute, this isn't what life is supposed to be about. I am a born-again Christian. No, this is the angelic conflict. This is, what, this is what life is. And had Adam and Eve not messed it up in the Garden of Eden, we wouldn't have anything like this. But they failed. And God made certain that we received by 
imputation their old sin natures that they acquired. So every one of us have an old sin nature. So what we're doing is we're looking for human answers, human viewpoint answers, something that man can solve. Man can't solve this problem. God's already solved it. But what we need is to find out what God says about all this, take his principles, his promises, his doctrines, his techniques, and make pertinent application to the circumstances of life when we find ourselves in adversity. That's pressure. And doesn't always have to be a snow uh, a snowstorm. It might be that I'm walking down the walking down the uh, down the street or, or on on the way to uh, to the office at work and look down and my shoestrings are broken. My shoes are flopping on my feet. Wait a minute. Wait just a second. Oh no, I can't believe this. No, it always doesn't happen to be a big thing. It's just adversity, something that causes pressure. So here's the issue. Don't blame God for your difficult circumstances. Why? He placed you there to strengthen you by trusting him and his word. And I have this, I have this written in my notes from weeks ago. Life is tough. Stop complaining and trust God. So don't blame God for our difficult circumstances. He's the one that allowed you to be there. And you are there to be strengthened by learning to trust him. And when you learn to trust him and his word in your circumstance, you will think, you will speak, you will feel, and you will do exactly like Christ. See, that is occupation with Christ. Occupation with Christ. Figure it this way. Let's suppose on a scale of 0 to 100, you're going to think like Christ. On a scale of 1 to 100, you're going to, you're going to speak like Christ. You're going to talk like him. On 0 to 100, you're going to feel like Christ. 0 to 100, you're going to act like Christ. You're going to do what he would do. Now you've got four things here, 0 to 100. And what you and I need to do is to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, what degree are we in each one of those? Anywhere from 0 to 100 in terms of how we think, 0 to 100 in how we feel, 0 to 100 in how we speak, 0 to 100 in how we do. And see, what we're doing is evaluating our own lives and realizing that unless we get to the point where it's 100% think, 100% speak, 100% feel, 100% do, we are not totally occupied with the person of Christ. And it's not enough to be occupied 99%, 90%, 80%, 51%, because God wants us in the promised land, not on the border of the promised land. He wants us in the promised land, and you get there when you actually reach maximum spiritual maturity. That's the end of our journey. That's the end of our journey. So we're not going to blame God. You shouldn't blame God. We, sh we shouldn't blame God for our difficult circumstances because he places us there to strengthen us by trusting him and his word, and you have to have his word before you can trust him. Life is tough. And what Paul says is stop complaining. Stop arguing. Stop griping. Trust God. Then we see fear and sorrow what we're doing is looking at four things before we actually get started. Fear and sorrow will not deliver you from adverse circumstances. So when you find yourself in a, in, a, in a situation that's just tough, pressure galore, fear will not deliver you from that. Sorrow will not deliver you from that. God wants you and he wants me to die to our unbelief and trust in self. Stop trusting in yourself. See, that's subjectivity. That's not objective. Trusting in self is looking at the circumstances from your viewpoint rather than looking at your circumstances from God's view viewpoint. So here we have this unbelief, this big system of trusting in ourselves 
And God says, here's what I want from you. I want you to die to that. Not die physically. He wants us to stop our unbelief. Stop your trust in self. And begin to grow and move from zero to 100 in the way you think, way you feel, way you speak, and way you do. Occupation with the person of Christ. That's the Christian way of life. In verse 1 of chapter 14, it says, And the people wept all that night. Recall this. As God invited the Israelites to take possession of the land, and see, God invited them to do that. That's why they came out of Egypt. God want to put them, wanted to put them in the promised land. He wanted them, want them to be in a land that was flowing with milk and honey, fruit, joy, peace, good news. So as God invited the Israelites to take possession of the land of Canaan, what did they do? They rebelled against God and mourned their loss. Stop. Make sure you understand what they're losing. What are they losing? God promised them the promised land. He promised them to go into the promised land. This is yours. It will be yours forever. So what happened? They find themselves, they find themselves in, some, uh, in some pressure under some adversity. And what do they do? They rebel against God. And guess what they do? They mourn their loss. They knew that if they wanted to go back to Egypt, they're not going to get the promised land. So they wept all night long. What are they weeping about? Oh, if we don't go in, we're going to lose our land. Fail to reach the promised land. So this is why when you take a look at your own life, moving from babyhood to adolescence, to spiritual self-esteem, spiritual autonomy, maximum spiritual maturity, or babyhood, adolescence, super grace alpha, super grace bravo, and ultra super grace, those three levels of spiritual maturity, as you're moving from one to, one to another until you reach the promised land. And remember now, when you reach spiritual maturity, that is spiritual self-esteem, ultra super, uh, super grace alpha, that the first thing that happens is God is going to give you Paul's thorn in the flesh. He's going to give that to me. And you have to pass that test in order to get, oh, in order to, get to spiritual autonomy, super grace bravo, where you're going to undergo momentum testing in several areas, people tests, doctrinal tests, disaster tests, etc., you have to pass those in order to be able to get to maximum spiritual maturity where you're going to undergo evidence testing where God is going to turn Satan loose on you. What? How long is it going to take for us to understand this? Now, I know you understand. But what about the multitude of people out here don't understand any of this? And all they're doing is complaining. And God looks down at the number of Christians in this country and says, Oh, my goodness, look at all these Christians down there. Oh, wait a minute, whoops. Look where they are. They've fallen from my plan. They're failing in the laws of divine establishment. They don't understand freedom. They're, uh, what they're doing is they've, they've just fallen in line to Marxism that leads us to communism. Do you hear that? That's where this country's headed. What about all the other things that are going wrong? Huh. How are you going to handle these? God says, look, I want you to learn, I want you to, learn to, to look to me for these. And when we look to him and use his word, that doesn't mean he's going to change any of this. He's not going to change the circumstances necessarily. What he's going to do is change us in the midst of the circumstance. And the truth of the matter is, if God takes this country out and lets this country fail, and remember, we're not in prophecy. Nowhere are, is the United States of America in prophecy. The shining city on a hill is not there. So what happens to it? It's either changed from what it was into what it's going to be, or it'll just be blown off the, blown off the map. 
But in the meantime, moving toward that, you and I need to be looking to God and His answers and maintaining the status of occupation with a person of Christ in every circumstance of life so that the guy next door, the, the person the, the person that you're working with, the, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, your mother, your father, your children, whoever, will see what the Christian way of life is. Deliverance from hell and the lake of fire, deliverance from the old sin nature, and my goodness, living in eternity future with all the blessings and the rewards that God has stored up for us. If we'll only turn to him. Unbelief, which is lack of faith. What is unbelief? Unbelief is simply failure to trust God. So unbelief, lack of, lack of faith, made these Israelites think that this good thing, <laughs> the gift of the promised land, was an evil thing. They thought, oh no, no, we don't want this. Look what's happening. We want to go back to Egypt. See, their lack of faith, their unbelief, made them actually believe that the promised land was an evil thing. So what's the application here? See, we need to learn some things from all this. Here's the application. This should teach you, it should teach me, it should teach us as born-again Christians about the tragedy of unbelief. See, unbelief is a tragedy of life. Because unbelief is related to the angelic conflict. Not just related to the Christian way of life. Not just related to a religious way of life. It's related to the angelic conflict. And there are consequences, eternal consequences, related to the tragedy of unbelief. You see, less than two years out of Egypt. That's all they've been gone. They've been traveling less than two years out of Egypt. And they're standing on the threshold of the promised land. That's where they are. But guess what? After all that time. No. We don't want to go in. Look at the size of those people in there. Look at their armies. Look at the land. Oh my goodness. So in the first 10 chapters of the book of Numbers. See we're in 14 now. But in the first 10 chapters of the book of Numbers. Israel was fully prepared. Listen to that. They were fully prepared to go forth and live as promised land people. They are on the verge. Those of, you, those of us from Arkansas, you know that when you go from here, from, from Little Rock, in, from this, this part of Arkansas, into Tennessee, and you're, you're going into Tennessee, you cross over a bridge in Arkansas, and go right into Memphis, Tennessee. So what, what they were doing, they were right there on the edge. They were just about to get on the bridge to go into Memphis, to go into Tennessee. Now you just, you just figure your own place, wherever you're from. How about this? Be on your city line or your county line and going into another county. There you are. You're right on the line. All you've got to do is take another step. And, you're, and you are into the land that God has promised you. Into whatever it is that he's promised you. So in the first 10 chapters of the book of Numbers, Israel was fully prepared to go forth and live as promised people. Now what's the key phrase here? Two words. Fully prepared. Well, what does that mean that they were fully prepared? From the time they left Egypt till the time they got to where they are now, God had organized them. This just wasn't this just wasn't uh, wasn't uh, hundreds of thousands of people that were scattered around somewhere. No, He gathered them together. Where are they? They are in Egypt. This is God's plan for human history. They were at one time outside the outside of Egypt. But there was a reason why God got them all down into Egypt. They're down there for 400 years. He's gathered them all together. So now when they leave Egypt, here they are. A group of people gathered together that God wants to use. Not only had he gathered them, he cleansed them. What happened? Before they left down there, they got saved. There was not one person that came out of Egypt that wasn't saved. 
So he had organized them. He had cleansed them. He purified them. He'd forgiven them of all their sins. He set them apart. What do you mean set them apart? That's their genetic structure. These were Jews. After the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he organized them. He cleansed them. He purified them. He set them apart. And he blessed them. How did he bless them? He made every provision that they needed to get into the promised land. And guess what he did? He also taught them how to function as priests. He gave them the Mosaic Law. So he brings them out of Egypt. They are totally prepared to go forth into the land and live as promised, as promised land people. He organized them. He cleansed them. He purified them. He set them apart. He blessed them. And he taught them how to function as priests. So during the period of their journey from Egypt to the promised land, Israel was made to remember two things. Get this, folks. He brings them out of Egypt. They got this two-year journey, on the, and they're on the promised land. And during that period of time, guess what he did? He made them remember two things. And what did, he rem what did he make them remember? This means that God dealt with them in all of their unbelief and all of their rabble-rousing and all of their complaining up against, against Moses and against God and against somebody else, he taught them to remember judgment spared. Get that? Judgment spared. God could have spiritually nuked these people. We're in, we're in number nine right now. We've already seen these nine occasions where they just belly ached and griped and complained. And God could have wiped them off the face of the earth. But here they are, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. They look back and say, oh my goodness, God could have just destroyed us here and there and there and there and there. He said, but no, guess what? He didn't do it. He taught them to remember judgment spared. They deserve punishment, but God withheld the punishment. The second thing he caused them to remember was deliverance brought Judgment spared, he didn't do what he, what he could have done, and deliverance brought, they, needed, they had need for something. They had need for water, they had need for, for food, they had need for the, the, the Red Sea to open up. Everything that they had need for up to this moment of time, God met their need. And when you look at your own life, God has met your needs. The one thing he's done is kept you alive. See, he's not done with you yet. He wants us to go to maximum spiritual maturity. He wants us to be able to give evidence testing. Can you imagine? Could you imagine all of this time from Adam right down to today? And let's suppose the rapture occurs tonight. God looks around and says, uh, excuse me, it's uh, time, for the, time for the beam of seat judgment. And uh, let's see, I, I, I want to, oh my. I don't have anybody that can give evidence to the sufficiency of my grace. Why? Because we didn't make it to maximum spiritual maturity. Thinking, feeling, speaking, and doing exactly like Christ did. Setting sin aside. And this is one of the things that I wrote, wrote down this morning. It's a, it's a tragedy to hear, to hear pastors say, well, you know, we have to sin every day. Everybody sins a little bit every day. No, we don't. No, we don't. No, you don't have to. See, this is God's plan for our life. If we died, if our old man died with Christ on the, on the cross... When, if our old man died on the cross with Christ, that means God has given us deliverance from the old sin nature, and all we have to do is make the right choice. Well, why are pastors teaching this kind of thing? One of two reasons. Either they're ignorant of truth, and or they've got their own problems, they 
haven't gotten victory. They don't know how to get victory. So what they do is they make an excuse. They rationalize for you so that they don't have to feel guilty about what they're doing wrong. But that's not right. Each one of us need to be delivered 100%. It is a choice. And one of my one of my very, very dear friends has reminded me time and time and time again that one of the things that changed his or her life, not going not to tell you who it is or dis, disclose that, but I want you to know what this person told me. They said, when you stood before those children at the Southeast Youth Camp, youth camp with pastors present and told us that we don't have to sin and that sin is a choice and if you can choose to sin, you can choose not to sin. They said that just blew their minds because they said they were waiting. This person said that he or she was waiting to hear that said by a pastor because that's something they believed they were never hearing. And yet it's true. You have no excuse. I have no excuse for sinning. So in addition, Israel was given God's presence as a guide. Israel was given God's presence as a guide. He organized them, he cleansed them, he purified them, he set them apart, he blessed them, and he taught them. But in addition to that, God's presence was a guide for them coming out of Egypt all the way to the promised land. They weren't just following some map out there, they were following God's guidance, the cloud and the sky, etc. Here's how I'm going to lead you, just watch, just follow me. Our cloud, folks, is the, is the Word of God. Our cloud is the Word of God. Following God. Guiding, guiding us. So Israel was given God's presence as a guide, and they were given the provisions needed to lead them. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, reading, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this down, and I'm saying, oh my goodness. Oh, listen. Israel was given God's presence as a guide, and they were given the provisions needed to lead them. But, oh my goodness, not again. Their unbelief prevented this otherwise prepared people to receive God's promises. And what was the big promise? The big promise is to go into the, into the promised land, cross over into Canaan. I'm with you. Don't you worry about those people in there. I'll take care of them for you. But their unbelief prevented this otherwise prepared people to receive God's promises. So as you grow from babyhood to adolescence, let's put you in spiritual self-esteem. Let's put us in spiritual autonomy. But oh my goodness, while we're here in spiritual autonomy, we've passed them, we've passed the, the doctrinal test, yes. We've passed the people test. But oh my, look at this disaster. I can't help it. Guess what? When your bank when your bank collapses, when the government has your money, the money you've saved up all your life for retirement and everything, what happens when you find out that your bank is closed? What happens when you find out something else that took place? Oh my, oh my. See, this is the disaster that will keep us from getting to maximum spiritual maturity. And guess what? When that happens, we don't receive the promise. Question. And I ask this honestly. And I'm going to ask myself. Jim Bertel, are you plagued with unbelief? And I don't mean 100%. I mean, do I have a sniffle of unbelief? Do I have the, the beginning stages of unbelief? Am I plagued with any degree of unbelief? Here's what God's telling us. This is what he's telling us to do. Well, I guess I can't. 
I, I can't do that. Let's go back to Egypt. So here's the principle. Unbelief prevents the believer from receiving what God has promised. Every time God promises something, if you or I are not willing to believe it, you or I, the unbeliever, is not going to receive what God promised. That's a principle. So when we move on out of verse 1, into verse 2 and 3, the first half of verse, uh, first half of verse 3, what we learn here is the Israelites, these, they rebel, they rebel by grumbling. See, just grumbling is rebellion. God says, here, I want you to do this. Oh, well, well, hey, you're rebelling. Grumbling is rebelling. rebelling. Well, I'm not sure. Rebelling, rebelling. All the sons of Israel grumbled. Wasn't a few, the whole crowd. All of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. See, these are their leaders. God was, um, Aaron was the high priest. Moses was the leader that authority delegated by God to Moses. Lead him out of lead him out of Egypt. But all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the entire congregation said to them, oh, "If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or, or even if we had died here in the wilderness. So why is the Lord bringing us into this land?" <laughs> to fall by the sword. You know, our wives and our little ones, they're going to become plunder. Well, all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. So understand this. The grumbling of all the sons of Israel was directed first toward Moses and Aaron. Look at that. It says all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. So their grumbling was first of all directed toward Moses and Aaron. But we can't stop there. Since Moses and Aaron were the Lord's leaders, what this means is that all the sons of Israel were really grumbling against the Lord. What do you mean by that? Well, let's understand something. This is where we set our minds to something. Where we think about something. You see, the goal of Moses and Aaron, what was their goal? Their goal, Moses and Aaron, their goal was to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. But guess what? That was also the Lord's goal for the people of Israel. See, God's goal for, for the people preceded Moses and, his, and, his, and Aaron's goal they didn't know about this, and God said, oh, I've got, I've got a goal here. I've got this goal, and I guess I see my internet connection again is unstable. That's what it's telling me. I don't know how that's, how that's hindering. I'll talk to some of you after class. Lord, continue to let us go on. The goal of Moses and Aaron was to lead the people of Israel to the promised land, but that was also God's goal. Therefore, this is what we need to understand. The grumbling or the complaining of the sons of Israel was not just against Moses and Aaron, but it was against the Lord, even though they wanted to hide it by directing their complaint against Moses and Aaron. Oh, Moses and Aaron, you shouldn't have done this. You should. Listen, God told them to do this. So what this means, again, not rocket science. If you're complaining against uh, uh, about Moses and Aaron, who were told by God to, to do something and Moses and Aaron were doing it, they're not just complaining to Moses, about Moses and Aaron, they're complaining about God who actually directed Moses and Aaron to do this. So once again, since Moses and Aaron were properly directed toward God's goal for Israel, for the sons of Israel to complain against Moses and Aaron was to complain against God. Look at my little diagram here. I've got two lines. I've got three terms here. God on the left, Moses in the center, and the Israelites on the right. And I've got an arrow that leads from God through Moses to the Israelites. And what that means is God, who is the final authority in all matters, he had a plan. And that plan was to take the Israelites to the promised land. 
So what did God do? God called Moses and said, look, I want you to lead these people to the, to the promised land. So what we have then is Moses and Aaron leading the people to the promised land, but they don't like it because they're running into adversity. So the arrow, first of all, goes from God to Moses to the Israelites in that order. Now, in the second line, we've got the same three, three, uh, three items. We've got God on the left, Moses in the middle, and the Israelites on the right-hand side. So while God told Moses to, and Aaron to lead the Israelites, what we see now is the Israelites, Israelites complaining to Moses, which means they're actually com complaining about God because he's the one who told them, Moses and Aaron, get them to the promised land. So we're in verse 2 and 3a, and we see them complaining against Moses and Aaron now, who've been directly, um, properly directed to get these people to the promised land. So what we want to do here is take a giant leap from verse 3 now up to verse 9 for just a moment. Because while these people are rebelling against God, and Moses and Aaron are looking at this, and realize that the, that the Israelites are, are uh, rebelling, when we look ahead to, ver, uh, to verse 9 in that same chapter, what we learn is that Joshua and Caleb also understood that this was rebellion against God, not against Moses. And what did Joshua and Caleb say? Here's what they said. He's talking, they're, they're talking to the people who are complaining. He said, only do not rebel against the Lord. Joshua and Caleb seeing these people just crucifying Moses and Aaron. But Joshua and Caleb also understood, they understood that this wasn't rebellion against Moses and Aaron. This was rebellion against God. He said, take them to the promised land. And in the meantime, Moses, we're going to have some adversity along the way. Just trust me. So what we do is we're going to ask a question here. Do you think that the Lord himself might have understood that this people of Israel were rebelling against him? And not against Moses. So God didn't look down and say, Oh my, Moses, I'm really sorry for you. These poor people down here, they're rebelling against you. No, God knew that it wasn't against Moses. He knew that these people were rebelling against him because he had told Moses and Aaron, get them out of Egypt and get them into the promised land. So now we went to verse 9. We skipped a, a forward six verses. Let's go two more. In Numbers 14, 11, God said, see, we asked, in verse 9, Joshua and Caleb understood. Oh, yeah, these people are rebelling against God. Now, when we get into verse 11, we know that God knows that they're rebelling against him. And here's what he said. How long will this people be disrespectful to me? How long will they not, not believe in me? Despite all the signs that I have performed in their midst. Joshua and Caleb knew this wasn't a complaint against Moses. It was against God. God knew that this wasn't a complaint against Moses. It was against him. He was leading them to the promised land. But oh my, every time we turn around, God, look here. We've got this adversity. Too much water, not enough water, bitter waters. No, no bread. Too much manna. Got all those things falling out of the sky now. No. He said, you've made us eat them until we're sick of it. It's coming out of our ears. Now, let's return back to verse 2. That's where, we, that's where we departed. And the people of Israel are speaking. And here's what they said. If only we had died. See, God was, here's what was going on. God was challenging the faith of the sons of Israel to take possession of the land. Take possession of Canaan. He was challenging their faith. He knew that there was going to be adversity. But he's already shown them time and time and time and time again with the supernatural events, the miraculous things. They should have known better. He delivered us here and here and here and here and here, but oh my, he probably won't deliver us here. What did God change? If only we had died. See, God was challenging the faith of the sons of Israel to take possession of Canaan and the challenge of their faith, what was it? It was too much for them. I don't want to do this one more time. Look how hard this is. So much so that the sons of Israel preferred to die in verse 2 of chapter 14. 
rather than go forward with what the Lord planned for them, go forward and possess the land of Canaan. Now, guess what? Something here for us to learn. And here's the issue. This is something for all of us to learn. So that if ever, anywhere along the line, you are complaining, you are bellyaching, you're marabine, you're whatever is going on in your life that's contrary to God's plan for your life, in a state of rebellion against God, those in rebellion against God lose the benefit of function in the sphere of the spirit. See, when you're when you are out of fellowship with God, you are out of the sphere of the spirit. And that's where, this, that's where the Christian way of life is lived. The Christian way of life is lived in the sphere of the spirit. The Christian religious life is lived in the sphere of the flesh. The Christian religious way of life is lived in the sphere of subjectivity. What is this about subjective period, uh, subjective pe people? What is it about subjective people? Well, here's what, it, here's what it is. You have your eyes on the problem and not on the solution. Well, what about an objective attitude? An objective attitude is manifested when people are faced with adversity and what they have is their eyes on the solution rather than the problem. The solution takes care of the problem. But in the sphere of subjectivity, you're looking at the problem, you have no solution, you're anxious, you're worried, you're caught up in disbelief, you're rejecting the Word of God. This is where thousands and thousands of Christians are today. And this is why you have a big snowstorm. This is why the, the flood water is going through town. This is why the, why the dams break. This is why the plane crashes. This is why something else goes wrong. God is dealing not just in one area or with, with one idea across this country. He's getting a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there. And when you look it all up, you see God pounding away at this nation. Pounding away at the world. So in a state of rebellion against God, those in rebellion against God lose the benefit of function in the sphere of the spirit. That's one thing. They lose the benefit of wisdom. There is no wisdom when you're in the sphere of the flesh. You lose the, you lose the, the benefit of discernment, which becomes elusive. You lose the function of proper decision making. It becomes impossible. Worry and fear dominate the thought patterns of people in rebellion against God. So let's be clear. To this generation of Israelites, God gave them exactly, listen to this, please, please listen to this, get it. Don't miss this. What did they say? Oh, let's go back up here for just a minute. If only we had died. If only we had died. Watch this. How long, would, now let's see. Yes, we, we need to go back up a little farther. I'm not going to go back. I'm just going to say it. These people are saying, if only we had died in Egypt. How about this? No, Lord. If only we had died in the wilderness. They want to die. So let's be clear. Right here. This generation of Israelites, to this generation, God gave them exactly what their rebellious unbelieving hearts wanted. If only we had died in the land of Egypt. Or if we had died in the wilderness. Get this. They died. They died in the wilderness and never made it to the promised land. I say get it. They got exactly what they wanted. Now when we move into verse 3, the people again are still speaking. The multitude of rebellious people. So why is the Lord bringing us into the land to fall by the sword? This is amazing. The sons of Israel are directly accusing the Lord of misleading them. They were angry with God. They were accusing him of plotting to murder them and their wives and children. You say, oh, wait a minute. No, no, that's not so. Hold it just a second. 
They were accusing God of doing what? Misleading them. Oh, yes. If you just come on out here and into the uh, into the wilderness now, I'm going to lead you to the promised land. You can't believe what it's going to be like when we get there. But every time they turned around, there was adversity. God was trying to strengthen them. And he rebelled against it. Are you rebelling against all the adversities of your life as you move from babyhood to adolescence, to spiritual self-esteem, to spiritual autonomy, to maximum spiritual maturity? Are you rebelling in unbelief? Failing to trust God in the midst of your adversity? Listen to the Apostle James. Listen to what James had to say. James understood this. He, know, he understood the Old Testament. He understood what the Jews did. He was a Jew. So James is going to write in James 1.17 and he's going to refer back to Numbers 14.3 that we're studying tonight. And here's what James said. With whom, and watch, he's talking about God now. Oh God, you brought us out here. You, you're misleading us. You called us out. You brought us out here to kill us, our wives and our children. James said, with whom is no variableness. That means when you take a look at the ten characteristics of God, sovereignty does what sovereignty is supposed to do. Eternal life is no less than eternal life. Love doesn't waver. Justice doesn't waver. Absolute righteousness doesn't waver. Omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence doesn't waver. Immutability doesn't change. Veracity doesn't change. God does not have any variableness to it. Well, a little bit here, a little bit there. No, neither shadow of turning. And what was he done? He was called a murderer by his own people. The Israelites said, oh, we should have died. We want to die here. But our children are going to be killed. Our wives are going to be killed. We're going to be killed. But calling God a murderer. So later, after this same historical grumbling, the same event, after this had occurred in Numbers 14, God commented on these events in Psalm 95. God, this, as God is revealing the word of God to us. We're back here in the, in the book of Numbers. We're seeing these people rebel. They were seeing calling God a murderer. God didn't forget this. We're reading about this in the book of Numbers. But God said after it's all after the, all this is over, God's going to have it written in Psalm 95, 9 to remind us again when we're reading through the Old Testament and seeing how the essence of God's work, God works. David wrote and said, When your fathers put me to the test, when your fathers... See, David is writing to a group of Jews now, and he's looking back at those at the the earlier generations of those Jews, and he's looking at those people in in the wilderness and said, When your fathers put me to the test, put me God, and God's speaking here, when your fathers put me to the test, how were they testing him? God had already provided everything they need to get into the promised land, and they're standing there griping, complaining, and belly aching about the adversity, and God is using that adversity to strengthen them, and all they see is that he brought us out here to lose the whole thing. And God goes on and said, They tested me, though they had seen my work, after seeing everything that he had done. Now, what that means is this. When you take a look at your own life as a Christian and see how God has delivered you in multitude of events, multitude of circumstances, made every provision for you, made everything possible for you to move on, here you are today, and darn if we don't find ourselves in adversity and we're doing the same thing they did, they're compla we're complaining. So what did he say? Remember, when your fathers put me to the test, they tested me though they had seen my work. Don't forget about all that God's done for you. Don't forget about everything he's provided for you up until this point in time. You see, the writer of Hebrews used these events, so not only did, not only did God repeat it in Psalm, Psalm 95, we find that James wrote about it in James 1.17, and now we find that the writer of Hebrews is going to do the same thing, and here's what he says. 
Here's what the writer of Hebrew says. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, and what does he say? We're going to go back and see what he says, because this is going to take us back to Psalm 95 again, back to where, uh, back to where uh, James was, was writing. Going to take us back to verse 8 in Psalm 95, and here's what the Holy Spirit said. Today, if you hear his voice, today, if, maybe you will and maybe you won't. If you hear his voice, whose voice? God's voice. How do we hear it? We hear his voice through the word. That's why we come to Bible class. Today, if maybe you will, maybe you won't. You're in Bible class, are you listening? Are you allowing the, Are you clean before the Lord? Is the Spirit of God teaching you the meaning? Are you choosing to believe that the truth that you're hearing? That puts, that puts this truth in the right robe of the mentality, gives you a frame of reference to be able to... to uh, to understand all that's going on around you. So he says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's negative volition. Don't reject the truth. Negative volition toward doctrine. Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. As on the day of trial. See, they were testing him. Where, were the, where was this happening? In the wilderness between Egypt and Ramah's land. Where? In Meribah, that's a location, and what they named this place Meribah, and it's complain, complain, complain. Where in your fathers, the Exodus generation, what did they do? They put me to the test. He'd made provision, he'd organized them, they had everything they needed to go into the promised land, take control of that place, and live there until God changes the events as human history moves into eternity future, wherein your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Seeing God deliver, deliver, deliver. And now they find themselves on a spot and they say, no, we, should have, we want to die here. Therefore, what, what did he say? Therefore I, watch this now. Therefore I, I what? Therefore I was angry with this generation. We know that God is not angry. That's an anthropopathism, a human attribute ascribed to God that he doesn't possess so that we can understand his policy, which is righteousness and justice combined dealing with the circumstance of life. And he saw that negative, negative volition among the whole group. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray. What's that mean? It means they go away from doctrine. They turn their, they turn their, their, their life away from the word of God, <clears throat> which is where their deliverance is going to come from. They always go astray in their heart. Now, hold on. <clears throat> go astray in their heart. This means that they already had the doctrine in the right lobe. They understood it. And this is why I say time and time and time again, coming to Bible class is not enough. Coming to Bible class is coming to learn the Word of God, but learning the Word of God is of no value if it's not used. And to have the Word of God in your heart and have a circumstance of life and fail to use it is to go astray. They always go astray in their heart. And they did not know my ways. They didn't know his plan. Oh, yeah, they're listening to all this stuff. They're taking in all this stuff. They've observed all this stuff. They knew it all. But guess what? They knew it and didn't use it. Then he says in verse 11, As I, God, as I swore in my anger, listen to me, they, the Exodus gener generation, certainly shall not enter my rest. And where is his rest? His rest is in Canaan. It's in the promised land. But for you and me, our journey is from babyhood to maximum spiritual maturity. That's ultra super grace. And he's saying, if we do, are not willing to obey his word, we will not enter his rest. We will not enter ultra super grace. That is 100% rest. 
And until we get into ultra super grace, 90%, 92%, 95%, 98%, 98%, 9%, 99.9% 9 is not complete rest. We have rest when we max out in maximum spiritual maturity. Now you see the Israelites journey from Egypt to Canaan. What did they do? They complained. Your journey, my journey, our journey is not from Egypt to Canaan, but our journey is from spiritual babyhood to ultra super grace. And my comment is stop complaining. Jim Bertel, don't complain. Whoever you are, if you're a Christian, stop complaining. Don't complain. Now, what we have in, in Hebrews 3, 16, and 9, 16 through 19, which is an extension of the passage we just read, where God says, in my, in my anger, I'm telling you, they're not going to enter the promised land. So here are five rhetorical questions that the, the writer of Hebrews made. We'll read these, and then we'll pick up this coming Sunday right where we leave off here. So here are five rhetorical questions that the author of Hebrews made, and he's talking about these Jews who came out of Egypt and were failing in, in their adversity. Hebrews 3.16, first rhetorical question, for who provoked him when they had heard? Well, he's talking about the Exodus generation that we're studying about it back here in Numbers chapter 14. Second rhetorical question. Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt, led by Moses, did not all those who came out, no, wait, did all of them who came out provoke God? The answer to that is everyone except Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, and possibly Moses' second wife and Aaron. But aside from those five, everybody else, what did they do? They provoke God. So who provoked him when they had heard? Heard what? Heard the word of God. Heard of the promised land. It was the Exodus generation. And every one of the Exodus generation, except Moses, Joshua, Caleb, and possibly Moses' second wife and Aaron, were people who provoked God. The third rhetorical question. And with whom was God angry for 40 years? Well, that's not hard. The Exodus generation. The fourth question. And this is the writer of Hebrews asking this. This is not something I've had. Uh, conjured up was it not with those who sinned whose dead bodies fell in the wilderness what's the answer yes that's who it was and now we have the fifth question rhetorical question and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest Canaan for the Jews ultra super grace for you and me who who did he swear that they would not enter into his rest? And his rest is Canaan. His rest is ultra super grace for you and me. Who isn't going to enter into his rest? But those who are disobedient. And what is disobedience? Failing to believe and trust and apply the word of God. Now we'll pick up a verse 19. Well, uh, yes. We'll pick up a verse 19. And uh, there's just a couple more thoughts here. And then move on into verse 3. And we're going to go all the way down through verse 19. Because this passage is loaded with information to help us understand the seriousness of what it means to live the Christian way of life. And the truth of the matter is, it's joy, joy, joy. And I'm thinking when God says, rejoice, rejoice in everything. Rejoice in everything. That means rejoice in the midst of adversity. Why? You can do that when you understand that God has your back. Well, let's stop right here. I could go on, but we need to stop right here. Just give thought to all that we've, we've talked about tonight. This, I, I, this, this is a great passage of Scripture. Father, thank you so much for teaching us through, through the Jews, Jewish sons of God. They were, they were your sons. They were believers, Father. 
But look what they did. They become an example to us. Don't live this way. Don't live this way. And I know people can say, oh, it's so hard. It's all, I, Listen, I know it's hard. But we make it hard for ourselves because we're, we're being subjective rather than objective. An objective mental attitude takes all that away. Hard is not a thing. Hard is, is gone, Father. It doesn't even exist in our, in our vocabulary when we're living an objective with an objective mental attitude. Looking at the solution and applying the solution rather than being bogged down by the circumstance. Father, I pray we get this. I pray we get it. Because if we don't, we're going to get more of what the Jews got. You bring fire down on them. You burn them up. You bury them in a, in a, in a pit that uh, the earth opens up and just swallows them. Time and time again, we see your, your, your righteousness and your justice at work against negative religion. This is not a game, Father. This is life. This is what it's all about. And we praise you for it because we know that we have the capacity of reaching ultra super grace, giving evidence to the sufficiency of your grace at the time that Satan takes us to the, to the witness stand. It's all a part of life. And I pray, Father, that I'll be one of those that goes to the witness stand. But we've got to stay true to your word. It's more than just talking about it. We've got to do it. Thank you for this evening today. Thank you for today in Christ's name. Looking forward to coming back this coming Sunday. Anticipating it. Can't wait till it gets here. To hear the next lesson. Taking the daily Bible lessons. Father, I'm led now not to, not to put out any more prayers for America. You've led me to, in this direction. They can get that if they want to. It inspire and ignite U.S. dot U.S. if they want it. But I'm going to give my time to studying and teaching, studying and teaching, studying and teaching, and living as a demonstration of the reality of your truth. In Christ's name, amen. Let me thank all of you on, on web, uh, on um, Zoom that are logged on tonight. I, I thank every one of you. Those of you out here on, on Facebook, God bless all of you. I appreciate you. I love you. You're my, you're my crown. I can't say it in any other way. I, I, there's, I don't have words to explain my love for you. In Christ's name. God bless you. We'll see you this coming Sunday. Bye-bye. Recording stopped.